Hi, uh, my name is Vaughn Stewart. I'm the director of the Digital Act Studio here at UNCG, and I'm going to give you a little workshop today on how to make an effective PowerPoint. So before I begin, I just want to mention a little bit about the Digital Act Studio. Uh, the Digital Act Studio is one of the multi-literacy centers here on campus. So the multi-literacy centers are the Speaking Center, the Writing Center, and the Digital Act Studio. Uh, and we all sort of function the same way. You can bring in a project to our spaces and a trained consultant will sit down with you and talk to you about how to make that more effective for a given audience. So we are located on the lower level of Jackson Library. Uh, you can make an appointment online for a 30 minute or an hour consultation. Uh, we do also accept walk-ins, so please come on by. And we can help you with anything designed, uh, composed, or presented digitally. So whether this is a PowerPoint or a uh, poster you're doing for a class uh, or a podcast or a video, we can help you out with that. Uh, we also work at any point in the design process from initial planning to final production uh, and the finishing touches. And we work on anything either for classes or for personal stuff. If you have a personal website you're making, uh, we can help you out with that as well. So before we begin, I just want to kind of go over a couple of preliminary things. First, the main points for today uh, in designing PowerPoint slides, uh, you should be consistent in all of your design choices. You should be as concise as possible. And you should make sure that you're using appropriate style choices, that everything meshes together well. Although you may not expect to hear this, I do want to put in a plug for themes. Now, if you really don't know what you're doing, you don't quite feel like you have a good handle on design in PowerPoint, I wouldn't recommend that you just start from a blank document and design your slides. Start with a theme. You can usually find a bunch of good serviceable themes. Uh, today, this presentation is actually based on a theme that's available uh, for PowerPoint. Now, when you find a theme that you like, you aren't beholden to all of the style choices that it makes. Uh, under the Design tab, uh, I would recommend that even if you choose a theme, you look through the variants, which will give you different colors. Because perhaps you like a certain layout for a theme, but you might not like the color palette that it's using. So check through the variants to see if there's something that works better for you. So let's begin with content, and I'll talk about a few kind of subcategories here, your overall organization and how you use text and images. So in terms of your organization, there are a few things that you can do to really enhance audience retention. Um, the first thing you can do is build in previews and reviews throughout your PowerPoint. So before you start a section, you can overview what's going to happen in there. Here you can see that it was done on the title, on the section title slide itself, where it says what's going to come up in this section. And then at the very end, I'll have another review of this entire section that summarizes the points that were made. You should also have clearly defined sections. Uh, you can usually do this by using layout of your slides so that a title slide does not look like a section header slide, which doesn't look like a body slide. Each of those types of things should look at as a sort of distinct item, and the consistency of them will re reinforce for your audience that these are different types of information, uh, and that will help them follow the overall organization of your uh, PowerPoint as a whole. Finally, you should use descriptive titles. Make sure you don't just have a title that's like, why? Question mark. But use descriptive titles so that when people get a slide of information and you're talking about talking through it, they will actually be able to follow and synthesize the information on that slide. Now, Let's move on to text. And one of the most important things that you can do is to minimize the amount of text that gets put onto PowerPoint slides. Uh, we've all sat through sessions where somebody just, they put every single word that they are going to say onto their slides, and then they just read them. And that is terrible. Uh, that's really annoying. And it makes you wonder why you're there. Now, if we look back, 
at our initial uh, key points here. We had quite lengthy bullet points for consistency, concision, and appropriate style choices. Uh, we probably didn't need all that information and could have gotten by with just those three, uh, those three minimal bullet points of consistency, concision, and appropriate style choices without the descriptors behind them. This is because your PowerPoint exists as a combination of slides and speech. It doesn't exist solely in slides and it doesn't exist solely in your speech. These two halves combine to make the whole. Uh, and remember that you don't need to have every last piece of information on your slides because you're going to say it. Similarly, you don't have to have every last little description in your actual speech when you can just put it down on your slides and people can read through it at their leisure. All right, I want to talk next about images. Now, your images can go wrong in many different ways. Uh, you need to make sure. Uh, that your images are appropriate for the content you are talking about and appropriate for your audience, and that they aren't jarringly dissimilar in style. So if we go back to the last slide, uh, we illustrated slides and speech with a picture of a photographic slide, so that's a little bit different, and a microphone. These are two kind of metaphorical representations of those concepts. Now we could go more literal. Uh, we could actually have uh, images of slides, of PowerPoint slides, and images of somebody giving a speech. That's perfectly fine too, although having those four slides there does make that particular slide a little bit busy. But what if we traded out those slides with this, an illustration of a slide? Now, this is very weird for many reasons. Uh, for one, it is a uh, homophonic, um, representation of what slides we are talking about. Um, we aren't talking about the slides that make kids go, yay. Uh, we're talking about the slides that make uh, many people go snore. And we've paired this illustration of a slide with an actual photograph of a speech. Uh, so there are many mismatches here. Uh, there's a mismatch not only in the style of the uh, images used, but also a mismatch in sort of the um, one being strainingly used symbolically and then one being very literal. Now, when people use images in their slides, uh, we really need to take a beat here and talk about usage rights and considerations. Online, the most common licensing structure that you'll find for images is the Creative Commons licensing structure. Creative Commons was developed in response to the fact that media producers putting their stuff online really had no good way to state exactly how they wanted their images, their products used. So Creative Commons developed a structure where media creators can allow their works to be reused in certain ways. And they can provide all of these different stipulations on them. I won't go into each one of them. I'll, I'll just highlight a couple here. The buy CC BY means that you must attribute the original creator. And that last one there on the right, CC0, means that the work has entered into the public domain. It means that the creator has revoked every last right worldwide to this media production. So you could use a CC0 image in anything, in a commercial print uh, calendar, on a menu, on your website, in a video. You can use it anywhere without restriction. Now, even though you will find many CC0 images online, this doesn't mean that you're freed from an academic requirement to cite where you got things. So I do want to take another moment and say, in general, always, always, always cite your images. You can see that done in this PowerPoint as the in little tags beneath the images of where I got them from. You can generally cite inline that way, or you can cite in a clump at the end. If you do have a style guide, make sure you follow its requirements. The final thing I want to say about images is, importantly, where you can get some. Now, if you just Google, say you need an image for a dog, and you just Google dog, you're going to find a bunch of images of dogs, but you aren't actually going to find things necessarily 
that are licensed in a way that allows you to use them. So here are some resources for you to get images that you can use. Uh, one resource is Unsplash. It primarily trades in CC0 licensed photographs. Very nice, very well composed photographs that you can use for anything you want. The second is Pixabay, which is like Unsplash in that pretty much everything on there is CC0. However, it also has videos and illustrations in addition to photographs. So it has a, a bit of a broader scope and tends to be more stock photo-y uh, than Unsplash. The Noun Project is another great site if you ever need well-designed icons. And finally, Creative Commons itself has a search functionality built into the website where you can look through a bunch of other sites to, to kind of harvest Creative Commons license content on them. So in summarizing some effective advice for the content on your PowerPoint slides, it's important to have both previews and reviews. Here's your review. It's also important to have clearly defined sections to your PowerPoint slides, often done through the different layouts of slides. You should avoid at all costs really text-heavy slides and make sure that your images reinforce your message overall. And always try to avoid reading your slides verbatim as was just done here. All right, enough of that. Let's move on to layout. So let's talk about layout and let's start on some familiar footing. Frequently, you'll use layout to show people the different sections of your PowerPoints by having different formatted slides that show them that we're beginning a new section uh, or that we're at the title slide or the very last slide. In general, you'll have three different types of slides per PowerPoint, a title, a section change slide, and a body content slide. And if you use a theme, most of them will have this kind of already done for you. But if you're creating your own, uh, make sure to think of a few different layouts to enhance this sort of organization. Next, in terms of text and laying out your slides, there are some just some requirements um, or some good advice that you probably want to follow. Make sure that things are readable. Um, if you do use a theme, make sure that it actually is readable. Don't believe that the theme has your best interest in mind and is just going to choose make all of the right design choices for you. So if we look at this slide, this is how it would look if I used the original themes choices for font decoration and sizing. It's rather small. Um, and it's really, especially if this is being presented in front of a bunch of people and not on a computer screen, um, it would actually be very hard to read. So in general, you want to keep body text to about 28 point as a minimum especially if you're presenting in front of a bunch of people and they've got to read it off a projector. You also want to try to keep those titles that you have on a single line. It looks really weird to have them break across two lines. And you also want to be really consistent with your sizes of your fonts, uh, what you're using for the title, what you're using for the titles on body slides. All of these really have to be 100% consistent. When you're working with text and images together, you're going to want to try to balance them out. Uh, you aren't going to want to overcrowd a slide with too many images on it. So let's take a look at one of those right now. Now you can see that this uh, looks like it was designed by an eight-year-old who just wanted a bunch of pictures on it. Um, the pictures are overlapping. The one of the person on the high wire is way too close to the text. And there's even this odd clip art of scales along with these different photographs. Now, if we wanted this to look like it was created by an eight-year-old, then hey, congratulations, well done. But if we want this to look more professional, we should respect white space, we should try not to crowd our text, and we probably want to eliminate that little clip art. So something like this would look much, much more professional. Now that slide still may have too many images on it. It is kind of a lot, it's a little busy but it looks a lot better than it did. So thinking about layout, there are some key things to take away. You should really be consistent in the layouts you have for your various types of slides, in your font sizes, and how you space things out, and in how you use that white space to balance text and images. Consistency is key across layout, 
it makes it look like your slides were intentional as opposed to haphazardly put together. And when they look intentional, your audience will think more highly of you. The last section for today is on style, and that covers a wide array of things. So the first thing I want to talk about is font. Now, in the world of fonts, of which there are thousands and thousands and thousands, there are generally two giant categorical classifications of fonts. There are sans serif fonts and serif fonts. The difference is serifs. <laughs> Serifs are the little bits at the ends of letters, the little daggers and lines that shoot off the ends of letters that make them look a little bit older, more formal. Uh, you often find serif fonts in print documents. Sans serif literally means without serifs. These are more blocky letters. They look more modern and more minimal, and they're often very effective for web um, based productions and for screens, as the serifs can get a little blurry depending on the resolution of the screen. There are also a bunch of specialty fonts. Uh, there are monospaced fonts that look like a typewriter font or a computer font, and these are really only used for representing computer code. Um, there are also decorative novelty, or sometimes people call these fancy fonts. So Lucida handwriting is one that people often use when they don't want to take the time to actually put their signature on a digital document. They use a handwriting font. Um, or the bane of Ryan Gosling's existence, Papyrus, as a font. Now, these decorative novelty fonts you want to generally stay away from. They don't often look very good. And especially for PowerPoints, if you are presenting this on a computer that is not your own, that font may not exist on the other person's machine. And then suddenly you're going to get that font replaced by a default font. Now you do have the option in PowerPoint to embed fonts, but even then you can get burned hard. Uh, if you embed fonts, then you may not be able to actually edit your slides later. So you're going to have to choose when you go to present your PowerPoint whether you want to take care of that typo that you just found, or whether you want your special font. Generally, when people style fonts on PowerPoint, it's because they want to emphasize something. And one main rule applies that don't overdo it. If you emphasize everything, then nothing is emphasized. You'll also want to generally avoid underlining. It adds another horizontal line on your slide, and it can kind of make your slides look a little cluttered. You just also don't want to use multiple emphasizing techniques together. Just pick one thing that's consistent throughout your slides and just stick with that, whether it's changing the color, capitalization, bold italics, or if you really need to, underlining. That brings me to color. Now we could go on a deep dive into color theory to describe ways to pick analogous or complementary colors, but most people doing PowerPoints will likely pick a color palette that is defined by a theme, or they'll stick to kind of white backgrounds with one color accent. So blues for this PowerPoint theme. If we think about color though, we can kind of think of it in two halves. There's a warm color half and there is a cool color half. And you'll hear these terms used very frequently when actually working with color, warm colors and cool colors. In general, you'll want to establish a color palette that probably has one dominant cool or one dominant warm color. You may want to pick a cool color palette if you want something calm, uh, something relaxed. You may want to pick a warm color if you want something a little bit more happier and excited. Now, cool colors can sometimes seem melancholic and depressing, and warm colors can sometimes seem aggressive. So be intentional with your color choices. You should also be selective. You shouldn't use colors that strain the eyes, nothing really bright and saturated. And make sure that the text on your slides is in a high contrast to whatever the background color is. So here, on this slide, you have white text on a very dark blue background, and then you have black text, well, for at least the first and fourth bullet points, on a white background. If you ever do feel adventurous and want to go 
kind of pick your own color palette outside of PowerPoint's themes, I would highly recommend looking at Adobe's Color Picker. It allows you to play around with various color theory models for picking a grouping of colors that might work together. Now, it can lead you astray at some times. You can get some really ugly color combinations. But you can also go to this Explore menu and you can find color palettes that other people have put together that they really liked. Uh, and you can take one of those color palettes to use in your productions. No presentation on effective PowerPoint would be complete without talking about animations and transitions. In general, just, just don't. The uh, often make your PowerPoint really distracting. Now, if you are going to use them, you really need to be consistent. Um, you can use them if you want to to reveal bullet points on long slides like this one. But oftentimes I found when people do that, they end up just reading their slides. And if you are going to use them, in addition to being consistent, really appear and fade are the only ones that look at all professional. Pretty much everything else in that box of transitions and animations really looks cheesy. So here's an example from this presentation. I actually used a transition called Morph uh, in PowerPoint because I wanted to show you exactly what I was doing. It was very intentional to show you how I was rearranging these pictures on this slide. Uh, so in that case, I had a really uh, important reason for showing a transition here. I wanted to draw your eyes to what exactly was changing. Um, now, if I just did this between slides because I thought it looked cool, not a good reason. So to sum up my main points about the style of PowerPoints, um, there are a few main takeaways. You really shouldn't venture too far away from sort of standard Microsoft Office fonts. Um, you should also have sort of a general overall color feel that is consistent and makes sense given the, the content of your slide and kind of the overall message that you're going for. Um, and please be very restrained if you try to use animations. Um, it often becomes very distracting uh, and it doesn't look, it doesn't really enhance the look of your PowerPoint overall. So now let's take a look at an example real quick. Here is a very popular thing to do, which is to use a entire, uh, an entire image as a background for a PowerPoint slide. Uh, here we have an image of a cabin, and we have benefits of camping, and we have some bullet points about why camping is great. Now, this is a very poorly designed slide. So the font choice here is a serif font. Um, and since the heading, the, the title here is so big, it, it's readable. But when you get down below to these bullet points, it's really hard to read. They're very small. It's not a blocky font that allows it to be read. Uh, it's, it's very, very small. In terms of layout, uh, you'll notice that instead of using a bulleted list, they just put these three points together uh, and you have weird spacing between them. Also, you'll notice that the part of the title uh, which is white text, occurs in the, in the center part there, the of, kind of overlaps a rather light part of the photographic background. This isn't great. This is an area where you don't have high contrast between the text and the background. So one of the ways to fix these problems is, let's change the font here. Uh, let's also move around the background so that we kind of have enough space of a regular sort of dark green background uh, so that that text is much more highly contrastive. Uh, and let's get all those bullet points aligned appropriately. Now, even if you weren't doing uh, a full photographic background, um, you should still rearrange things. Uh, this is based on a theme in PowerPoint um, that you could use, and it does a lot of the work for you. It makes sure that your titles and everything are aligned. Um, it uses a rather uh, standard, big, sans serif font. Uh, I do think that the font title here is a little bit light, uh, especially if you're projecting this on a screen. It might be a little bit washed out, uh, so that's something that you may want to change from the original theme. Um, we've moved that picture of a cabin over to the side, and that's one other area of critique that we might have for this overall slide is that 
we picked a background that is a cabin um, in the woods, and the woods sort of represents camping, but not the way that most people think about it. I mean, most people think about sleeping in a tent, not about going to a cabin in the woods. So we might want to choose a different image altogether to more effectively illustrate the content that we're actually talking about here. So just to bring this all full circle, um, if there's one sort of thing that you take away from today's presentation, I would recommend these three key points. This slide right here, that things need to be consistent. In general, you should be very concise, and you should also be making appropriate style choices given your audience. If you do those things, you're going to be much further down the road towards creating a very effective PowerPoint than just starting from a blank document and trying to wing it. Uh, make sure that you have uh, harmony between all of the, the design elements that you need, your typography, your color, the images you use, uh, the layout you have uh, for a given audience. And remember that everything is always contingent on your audience. The PowerPoint that you would create for a kindergarten class, I don't know why you would have a PowerPoint for a kindergarten class, but if you did, uh, it would be vastly different from what you would create for a business meeting. So always keep that in mind that audience is, is the primary factor in what dictates the choices that you are making. Finally, just to plug, uh, we here at the Digital Act Studio are happy to help you with any PowerPoint needs at any time. We're happy to help you with any digital projects you have. You can schedule an online consultation or a face-to-face -face consultation at our website. We also accept walk-ins uh, if we have consultants available to meet with you. So please come visit us on the lower level of the Jackson Library whenever you can. I hope that this presentation has been effective itself uh, and that you have a lot more tools in your toolbox for how to create a well-designed and effective PowerPoint presentation. Thanks. Thanks.